why why can't people just like acknowledge when people are like sad and like why can why do we have to call the women irrational and hysterical oh yeah it is completely unfair because you kind of feel like you're going a little bit crazy you know mm-hmm. especially when you're watching these kind of horror films a lot of times these movies obviously take the pov of the protagonist and the protagonist tends to be the victim of manipulation you know they are isolated from the outside world thus they are dependent on the people that are harming them and then they feel like they have nowhere to turn and they feel like they can't even trust their own selves and their own sanity Mm -hmm. and their own judgment because they're made to believe that their own judgment is wrong and Mm -hmm. how they feel is wrong and even though your body is telling you like this is not the place you need to be like there's something off here there's something wrong here like you cannot trust these people everyone else around you is making you feel like oh no everything's fine everything's okay you know you're overreacting you're being hysterical you're being delusional and it's pushing you in a way where like you're battling yourself like do i trust Mm these people that seem to have the best attentions for me or do i trust myself even though i don't even know if i'm right because everyone else is making me feel like i don't know what i'm talking about i don't know what i'm doing and it's this horrible yeah. sense of fear and i like that in horror movies because it feels so real because we can feel that in our own daily lives and to say the horror movies is different because like obviously as the audience we have the dramatic irony of understanding like girl you're in danger you gotta yeah. go but the you need to leave yes <laughs> But the protagonist doesn't know that. They don't see that. And they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So they're at a disadvantage because of that. But I could imagine as well, if you're in a situation, and it goes for, like, this film, it goes for Invisible Man as well, um, where it's like, if you are made to doubt your own emotions and your own thoughts and your own reality so much, and then you find one person who believes you and is, like, validating you, like, you're going to latch on and you're going to kind of ignore all the warning signs around that because, mm. like, you finally are being heard and being validated um, in a sea of, like, just completely being belittled. Um, yeah. 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 Sad. <laughs> and I did... You've rewatched Re- Invisible Man, right? hmm Yeah. Yeah. I watched it twice before our taping and the mm-hmm. movie is crazy. I it is crazy. <laughs> it's it's so much like more like um like uh heavy handed is kind of like uh I don't mean that in a negative way. It's so much more explicit than I remember it being. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like the kind of like uh that narrative of like she thinks she's going crazy and she's not. Like I feel like it's making explicit what so many films have done mm-hmm. and like had subtextual before it but yeah it is crazy like the more that happened i was like oh my god i forgot about all of this um mm-hmm. yeah they really jam a lot into that film yeah and um i remember when i was i remember i watched it for the first time um i kind of saw it i was watching it by myself and i knew it was a horror movie and i knew it was gonna be scary i did not realize how scary it was and yeah. this is the thing I love about new horror films is the way that there are new ways to scare audiences. And I think I love most about Invisible Man is the camera work because there are yeah. a lot of times where you're watching a scene and a lot of times, obviously, when you're watching a movie, the camera will follow the, the protagonist because that's where the story lies. But in this movie, the camera acts as kind of like a POV uh, for us, but also for Adrian. Because I remember mm-hmm. in the first, in one of the scenes in the beginning of the movie, when we're in um, the kitchen and mm-hmm. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Monsa's character, Cecilia, she's like making breakfast or something. And yeah, she's like I, cook frying eggs or something. Yeah. And yeah, her knife like falls off the counter. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. And it just kind of yeah. like slips. And then, you know, then you see the fire in the kitchen. But upon like my second rewatch, I was watching it and I was like, did he take the knife? Is he there? I didn't even notice the knife. <laughs> oh my god. I just noticed the fire. And yes. because they do that bit and then they also do so many things of just like lingering on empty rooms and you're literally just like scanning the frame of like for any little bit of movement and be like, where mm. is he? And it just like makes you so on edge. And it's such a like an opposite um kind of like uh horror impulse to do jump scares. Mm-hmm. Cause like you're just on edge and like you 
it's instead of something like loud kind of happening and scaring you it's like these tiny things that just like keep building up and it, i i thought it was so effective at like just building the suspense and everything yes. it was effective it was really really good and i loved it because um another thing that i noticed in the movie like you said um there are a lot of jump scares in horror films and in this movie it pans the camera like around the room i remember there's one scene where mm-hmm. she's like in her room and she's like putting a dress on like a hanger or something yeah she's camera... like folding clothes and stuff yeah yeah and so the camera it pans to like a corner of the room as meant to like signify that like adrian is there and he's watching her and i didn't really pick up on it until that scene where she's like standing outside the house and you see like the gust of air on the back of her neck and i'm like oh this is terrible yeah. because it yeah. perfectly mirrors how like victims of domestic violence feel you know after you leave that situation you kind of feel like you're always being watched because you're used to being in a situation where there's a lot of tension and you don't feel safe and you know what it's like when someone's watching you because you're used to your abuser like kind of watching your every movement and like keeping their gaze on you because they see you as like their property and even after you leave that situation you still have ptsd because you used to be you felt like you were safe in that environment with your abuser but you weren't and now that you're even outside of that your perspective is sort of warped and we see that Mm -hmm. when she goes outside to like get the mail because there's a guy there and he's a jogger and like you and i i would we would see someone jogging in our street it's like oh it's a guy he's jogging but for her she Mm -hmm could assume that that guy is adrian or that guy is like mm-hmm. someone adrian hired to kill her and she doesn't feel mm-hmm. safe you know she doesn't feel like she could like go outside and like leave her house and yeah this movie of course it's so good because adrian is there and she feels like he's there even though he's dead he's gone it's like clear that he's gone to everyone else except to cecilia because she feels like he's still around her and like of course we could chalk that up to like ptsd or like her paranoia but us as the audience we soon realize that like no he's there because he was Mm -hmm. sitting in her chair in her room like that's that's terrifying yes yeah because at the start as well there's a couple moments like uh where she's kind of like looking over her shoulder and like Mm -hmm. i think in those instances we there actually isn't anything that you know gives anything away and so you know maybe adrian is there maybe he's not um and it's kind of like showing her like hyper vigilance Mm -hmm. and then um it's just all those like little moments and you know that perpetual sense of firefly and like walking on eggshells and never being able to settle ever um and oh yeah it's so just like it's so icky kind of you know and uh i i really did think it was such a good uh representation of like literalizing those kind of fears that were um kind of yeah like subtextual and other things or kind of maybe just like a theme like very much kind of showing how she is seeing things that other people aren't like literally and it's kind of like the whole thing in the horror genre of these female characters seeing things and nobody else is seeing them are like noticing things and nobody else is seeing them and then in this like with invisible ban it's like just such a good kind of like i don't know it's just such a good um like it's, it's like story like it's just such a good yeah. way of like doing that theme um yeah I think it is a really awesome representation of what, like, domestic violence victims go through. And um, it's so interesting because we as the audience, we know uh, Cecilia's fear and paranoia is, you know, it could be stemming from her psychological trauma, which a lot of people, um, like the other characters in the film, think that that's where it's coming from. But we understand that it's the Invisible Man, which is adrian griffin and Mm -hmm. due to the fact that like there's no evidence it makes her story less credible and it's very challenging for her to convince other people that this is going on um and it's just it's so hard like it's so difficult Mm -hmm. because this movie so good but there are so many circumstances there are so many moments when i'm watching the movie and i'm like oh my gosh this is crazy like when storm reed's character gets smacked across the face yeah i fully yeah. screamed i was like oh yeah no. if you enjoy watching these highlights subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications so you know when a new video is uploaded 
that's yeah. that's the place where she can like reside and where she can stay and her mm-hmm. like harming you know her childhood friend's um daughter is a big no-no you know yeah yeah and yeah and i was thinking as well of like um the kind of points with james where she goes and she meets adrian's brother tom and she's like she has the the kind of bloody bottle of diazepam and she's like i know he's still here like i know he's watching me and like if we hadn't seen all the evidence like she does sound like a you know crazy person talking and like Mm -hmm. you can kind of like empathize we um, we empathize with her but we can also empathize with like James being like, oh no, like she's really not okay because he's seen her across these like past few weeks or month or whatever in that kind of state of like hyper vigilance and like mm. probably being scared by so much and you know not even be able to leave the house. And so um, I can empathize with like James's position so much, but it made me so mad when she went to the sister and the sister was like, I hate, like what was with that email? She's like, I didn't send that email, and she's very clearly like so disturbed mm-hmm. and like crying. And her sister was like just annoyed with her and wouldn't even talk to her. I was like, you're so you're so terrible. You know that she, like you picked her up from this abusive house where like her partner punched through the window and was like mm-hmm. trying to drag her out, and like you've seen everything she's gone through, and then you like get an email. And you're just like too pissed off to like talk to your sister who's like going through all this. I was like, babes, like just talk to her. Yeah. I also feel like if you see your sister in such distress, it is Mm -hmm. unlikely that she sent you that email. But you know, the sister obviously wouldn't have any other explanation as to who sent her that email. No, why would someone else send her such a terrible horrible email to her when it literally came from her sister's inbox? But if I receive something like that from my sister and she seems so confused and distraught and like confused i wouldn't think mm-hmm. that she like has like split personality disorder i would think like yeah. there's something else going on and maybe i should talk to her and figure out what's mm-hmm. going on and figure out if she's okay you know mm-hmm. and i wouldn't just dismiss her like that as well oh, it's no. just like yeah and how quickly people dismiss how she feels and what she's going through because of course like to believe that your dead husband is somehow still alive that does seem like something out of a movie and of course people would not believe that and it's hard for people to see what she sees because she's the one who's experiencing it and he's making it so like he is kind of driving her to the point of madness because he realizes that she does not need him in her life and that does not fit into his worldview so he is trying to slowly break her down so that she comes back to him and he can like have her be a part of his life because it's not that he loves her really or cares about her in any kind of way he just wants to control her because that is Mm -hmm. what narcissists you know seek out and he's so devoid of any kind of empathy and care for anyone other than himself that he's willing to hurt whoever he can to get what he wants and Mm -hmm. she understands that she knows that but everyone else thinks he's dead so Mm -hmm. the only other explanation is that cecilia is having some sort of mental break and that there's something wrong and he knows that you know he is slowly like planting the seeds to have her locked in a room where no one can get to her and that he can harm her or control her or watch over her and that Mm -hmm. slowly breaks down to the facade that he's not here anymore because who else beat up all those orderlies in Uh, that hallway that no one else saw also it was like it i thought it was like a representation of kind of how abusers separate people from everyone that they love Mm -hmm. like using all these like manipulation tactics and stuff and then it's just like how he um like hits sydney and he's like doing the email and everything and just completely isolates her like i just think um it's a good kind of like um i don't know i just think that the kind of like the invisible costume and everything about it is just such a good like metaphorical or whatever you want to call it way of like looking at this subject matter um mm. it was just I don't, it was just so effective and yeah um i do want to say that does remind me of like how obviously cults work because they look for mm-hmm. people that are lonely and desperate mm-hmm. and vulnerable and they desire some kind of like human connection and community and they're willing to go towards a community of people that are willing to accept them for who they are. Like recently I watched a documentary about twin flames on Netflix. Oh, okay. Like the Um, concept of twin flames or was there a cult called twin flames? So it was kind of a cult. Um, Essentially there Mm. was this couple 
um i forget their names even though i watched the documentary like a few days ago (laughs) but basically they had this idea that everyone has a twin flame in their life and there is someone out that everyone has like one soulmate and you know there's someone out there for you and they would have like these coaching sessions and this kind of like community of people and the husband and wife they believe that every single person can find someone who's meant for them and once you find that Mm -hmm. person you need to be with that person you need to love that person you need to marry that person and you have to be at that person at whatever cost it is whatever it takes you need to be with this person and so of course on the surface it sounds like a dating site it sounds like a dating website but as you kind of get into the documentary you realize that there's something a little more sinister going on where the founders of the community are kind of pushing these people who are single a little bit older and kind of desperate for a relationship and for love they're pushing them to seek out this companionship by whatever means necessary. And if you do not seek this out or if you do not attain it, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with the way that you're living your life. You don't love yourself enough. And they like openly gaslight people to like doubt themselves and feel like they have to like, you know, start stalking people or start doing Mm. things that are like not that great to try and find love and be with people. And they do this and they teach them that like, you know, your families don't understand, your friends and family don't understand and they don't see it because they are not ascended. They have not ascended in the way that we have. So they do tend to push out their family and t- tend to push people away because of course your loved ones will probably tell you they're like, hey, you're in a cult, you need to leave. And then you as a person who's a part of this cult, you feel like they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't see what you see. They are not enlightened the way that you are. And they're trying to take you away from this community that loves and cares for you. And they want to harm you in a way. So then you push them out of your life so that you can give yourself fully and devote yourself to this community to receive, you know, enlightenment and ascend, even though that is further harming you and you're pushing yourself into a dangerous community of people that are trying to take away your control, like take away your anatomy, take away your money and you know, force you to be the person that they want you to be to fulfill their own doctrine, their own ideology, which happens in a lot of cults, but especially in this one. Because Twin Flames, if you do happen to watch the documentary on Netflix, I don't know if it'll be on um, Netflix in your country, Mm -hmm. but if you do happen Mm -hmm. to get the chance to watch it, I do recommend it because it is, it's a wild ride, that one. Yeah. Is Is it a movie or is it a TV show? It's like... Um, a three-part series. Netflix does okay, that sometimes okay. with their documentaries, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting. Um, and sometimes I like it, but sometimes I find that like they're just like padding things to like make them. Like I'm just like guys, just make it, just make it like a 90-minute film instead of whatever. But mm. um, that does sound really interesting. I I do love I do love cult stuff. I think it's so interesting. Um, um, yeah, I'm not surprised that like a lot of the movies that we picked where it talks about women not being listened to and not being heard have to do with cults, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And the, the omen as well with like the kind of the culty stuff, of like the, the satanic cult stuff. It, it's mm-hmm. so, it is so interesting. Cause um, I feel like, I mean, so much of cult dynamics is based around gaslighting, you know, and mm-hmm. like making people mistrust um, the, their own like, opinions and their own beliefs and their own reality and you know placing seeds of doubt in like, the people around them and stuff and you know kind of um molding their brain to fit this like specific narrative and the thing is what you were saying about um people's bodies is that like in um the invisible man and rosemary's baby obviously like women's bodily autonomy is completely stripped away from them like in the invisible man um c, c-, or c- uh, is like um you know, taking birth control in private. And then obviously Rosemary in Rosemary's baby is assaulted and impregnated. And I mean, the same in The Invisible Man as well. And then also in The Omen, I know she, like, she loses her actual baby and is given, you know, this, like, child without her knowing. Mm -hmm. But it's just so interesting as well how, like, all these things are about women doubting their reality and, like, not being believed. And then also... Like, not only do they not have control over, like, their mind, like, their mind is kind of being manipulated, but also their bodies are also 
being manipulated and just used for other people's gain and it's just it's so sad since you're at the end of the video don't forget to like the video and leave a comment down below if you want early access to these highlights join our patreon patrons have access to our entire archive including full-length videos Patrons also have the opportunity to choose a topic for our podcast and they get the opportunity to be a guest. Join now.